Okay, we about ready? Okay, uh, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, welcome, I'm Chaz Ballou, I'm CEO of Aptable, and thank you for, uh, thank you for attending today. Uh, as many of you know, this webinar is part of a regular series, the Aptable Update webinar series. We do this quarterly. It's a presentation that covers uh, recent features and changes to the Enclave deployment platform and Gridiron security management products. Um, our goal at Aptable, the entire reason we get up in the morning, is to make the best tools for developers to build security into their architecture and organizations. Um, Today is going to be a bit of a special webinar. We're going to start with a segment dedicated to Meltdown and Spectre. And our new web security advocate, Alyssa, will be moderating a discussion with our engineers about those two vulnerabilities and what we've done to protect you, our customers, uh, from them. And then after that, we'll hear from Thomas Orozco, our Enclave lead, who will tell us about the new metric drains feature and a number of other releases for Enclave. So a bit of logistics to start. Uh, use the Q&A tool in Zoom here to ask questions uh, during the panel or during the rest of the webinar. Uh, Alyssa and Frank McCurry, our CTO, will moderate those and ensure that everyone's questions get answered either during the talks or at Q&A breaks or offline afterwards. Um, we're also recording the webinar as we've recorded previous ones. Uh, we'll, we'll make it available, post it on YouTube, and share a link to the recording, uh, the slides we have, and the transcript with everyone. So with that said, I'm going to introduce uh, Alyssa Shavinsky, our new web security advocate for this panel. Thanks, Chaz. We know that Meltdown and Spectre is a topic that's important to a lot of our customers. So we want to take some time to talk about how Aptable handled these vulnerabilities and how it impacts you. We're speaking today with Frank and Thomas. Frank is CTO at Aptable and Thomas is lead engineer for Enclave. Frank, Thomas, could you give us the TLDR on these vulnerabilities? Yeah, sure thing. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, so I'm sure by now most of you have heard about Meltdown Inspector. Uh, and part of the reason for the hype around these vulnerabilities is tied to uh, the, the kind of part of the computing infrastructure that these affect and the resulting very broad impact that they have. So in particular, Meltdown and Spectre uh, are both uh, vulnerabilities that explo exploit a flaw uh, that exists in basically every modern CPU architecture. And so pretty much anything running on a modern CPU from uh, you know, cloud computing infrastructure to SaaS software to your local desktop and laptop workstations uh, is affected in some way by Meltdown and Spectre. I think one thing that's worth adding and noting about these is that from a practical standpoint... Thomas, I think you're uh, muted. Okay. I apologize. Um, <laughs> All right. So the uh, yeah, one thing one thing that might be worth noting as well is the uh, the impact of these vulnerabilities. Um, in of uh, in of themselves, they they're not the worst vulnerabilities that have existed in say like Linux or like even other operating systems and so on. Um, <clears throat> but what makes them unique is beyond their scope and the fact that they affect practically everything, is that they actually uh, both of them are very difficult to detect if they're being exploited. That if if someone is like exploiting. Something like Meltdown against you is very difficult for you to know about that. Um, besides this, uh, Meltdown in particular is also very easy to exploit as well. Thomas, what does it mean to exploit Meltdown? Well, that's a good question. Um, so Meltdown, uh, what it lets you do essentially is if you, if you have, uh, on a platform like Enclave, if you have um, like a customer container running, and it's running, going to be running untrusted code, at least from our perspective, from the perspective of the platform, it's running arbitrary code really. Um, what Meltdown lets you do is kind of sort of break out of that isolation by reading memory that you normally should not have access to. So if you imagine you have like your app running and then there's the kernel memory, which is where like essentially the rest of the operating system is running, uh, Meltdown is going to let an app potentially read into that kernel memory. Normally that would raise an error, but with Meltdown you manage to kind of bypass that, uh, that limitation and, um, and gain read access to that memory, which may include things like, you know, if you have other processes on the same instance, they'll have their own environment variables, that's like an obvious target. Potentially there's like disk caches as well. Like there's lots of things in kernel memory that, that are sensitive and you get access to them through Meltdown. And you know, in particular, like this idea that uh, Meltdown exploits privilege escalation paths uh, is particular, or makes it particularly relevant for cloud computing infrastructure. Because um, whenever you're running in the cloud, uh, there's just by definition, many layers of separation between you and bare metal hardware. So for example, as a customer of Enclave, uh, you know, 
at, on top of the bare metal, you've got AWS uh, running EC2 instances. Uh, on top of that, you've got Aptable, another party uh, running Enclave, uh, an orchestration platform, where ultimately your own applications and databases run in Docker containers on top of that. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's that's part of the, the big threat and risk around vulnerabilities like Meltdown is there's just so many different ways and, uh, and barriers across which you can exploit this vulnerability. So can we defend against vulnerabilities like Meltdown and Spectre? And uh, what are we doing here at Optimal to proactively protect our Enclave customers? Yeah, sure thing. So, I mean, roughly speaking, there's two kind of general pathways for exploiting uh, a vulnerability like Meltdown. So the first is that you can uh, gain access to uh, data run by your peers. So other customers whose app and database containers are hosted on the same instance as you. Um, the way that we protect against this architecturally on Enclave is we uh, we require that all dedicated work, or sorry, all uh, sensitive re workloads, so whether you're hosting PHI or any other sensitive and regulated data, uh, those need to run on dedicated stacks. It's which, isolated. Yeah, so it's isolated, it's dedicated. Uh, it means that, you know, the EC2 instances that dedicated stacks run on, the networks that they run on are all belonging to just one customer and not shared with other Aptable customers. Um, the second way that you can exploit a vulnerability like Meltdown is to attack the pass itself. So to attack Enclave. And in this case, you know, as Thomas mentioned, there are environment variables, disk caches that may contain secrets. Uh, on our EC2 instances, some of these secrets are actually Aptable secrets. Um, and so the way that we protect uh, or mitigate the risk of accessing these secrets is by uh, separating our riskiest kind of uh, systems that run untrusted customer code from our most sensitive uh, environment variables and other secrets that are required to administer Aptable. So the Aptable architecture is based on trust and isolation. Can you talk a bit about those principles and those decisions? I think I'll probably speak a bit to that. I think it's important to uh, to think about the threat model under which we operate. Um, as a pass, really, the uh, one thing that's really important to understand whenever you're operating something where you're like running apps for other people, like a hosting platform, is that you kind of have to assume that your customer is in from a security perspective, that your customer is not your friend. You have to really assume that they're being hostile to you like really all the time. Um, in particular, that means for us, it's fairly easy to see why. Like if you look at Enclave, you can have you know folks signing up and creating like a new account that we, we don't know who they are. Like it's just anyone on the internet can potentially open their own account on a shared environment. And even in like dedicated environments where we have you know further trust because we've talked to these customers, potentially we have an idea of who they are. Like so a customer could get compromised. Like their app could get compromised because of a vulnerability in their app. At which stage, like potentially someone takes control of their app and someone happens to be running a trusted code, at which point you're back to the same place. There's a container running on your infrastructure and it's trying to do something nasty to you. So you have to always be thinking about this and that, that's driven a lot of the architectural decisions we've made with Enclave. Yeah, so we've actually put together a, a diagram that represents kind of how we think about threats. Uh, it assigns every single component of the uh, Apple or the Enclave infrastructure to uh, a specific threat level, uh, and then demonstrates how we isolate the riskiest components from the most sensitive and, and privileged uh, data. Yeah, and I think we, uh, so yeah, in that diagram you can see, we're gonna be starting at the, the right corner. You can see this, you have these like containers that are running, and as I explained, these are really, these are assumed to be hostile, and we expect them, again, really from a threat modeling perspective, we expect them to be constantly trying to break out. Um, as a result, since these containers are running on EC2 instances, we have to really give these instances a very low level of trust. In fact, we don't really trust these instances to, uh, from an infrastructure perspective, we don't trust them to do anything. We trust them to be always, like we, we, we really have to minimize how much we trust them to be acting legitimately. So ultimately, we do need to run tasks on these instances. Um, you know, we need to launch containers uh, and do another a number of other operations in order to like facilitate uh, releasing new app code or provisioning new databases. Um, so the way we do this is that we have a separate uh, job queue system that's built on top of Redis, uh, where we enqueue tasks telling these untrusted instances specifically what they should do. Uh, and in particular, we don't allow uh, the instances to ask for work items or determine what they're supposed to do on their own. Um, so it's always some other system 
that is in a more trusted, more isolated layer that is uh, placing tasks on a job queue, for instances, to run and making all of those decisions. Exactly. And the other system is something we call a sorry, sorry exactly. And the other system is something we call a coordinator. Um, our coordinators are running on separate instances. So the idea here is that whenever we have uh, this coordinator is going to be making calls to AWS APIs, making calls to our own APIs, we're just training new data. Um, this coordinator runs on a separate set of instances. We have a set of coordinators in each uh, region that we're located in. So there's some in US East one, US West one, US Central, and so on. These are running on their own EC2 instances, so no customer code is running next to them. Um, so we're able to trust them a little more, essentially. That said, it's still important to realize that uh, whenever you're like really architecting for security, you have to really not just look at you know who's giving orders, what direction data flows in, but also you know what data is being processed. Really, these coordinators give tasks onto the job queue, but they also you know read results from the same Redis instance. They, they will the coordinator will go back after asking for a container to be run. The coordinator will go back and check you know hey has this been done, and if it was you know what's the idea of the container and everything. So as soon as you're parsing data like this and it's also encrypted, so decrypting it, there's always the risk that you know maybe there's like other ways to like subvert that process. So even these coordinators have only for us, even though they're like some of our most critical infrastructure, they only have a very moderate level of trust. We in fact these coordinators don't have anything resembling long-term credentials. Yeah, so those long-term credentials are coming further up the stack uh, from what's ultimately the most trusted component in our infrastructure, our API services. Um, so specifically, I'm talking about our auth API and our ops API. Uh, so these run in a separate VPC on a separate set of instances from the regional coordinators uh, and are the only place where long-term credentials are stored. Uh, in our, other words, credentials that are able to uh, create those uh, narrowly scoped short-term ephemeral credentials for both AWS APIs and our own APIs. Um, so, you know, we isolate these instances. We also uh, separate the API servers that actually serve requests from the internet from those API uh, workers that do the job of generating credentials and, and storing the long-term uh, credentials that enable them to do that. Yeah, speaking of that, that, that last point you mentioned, I think is worth um, stressing a little bit, is that these, uh, what we're describing right now, these layers of isolation, we're talking about this really from the perspective of um, de-escalation paths that leverages meltdown. That is, if you break out of a container, how do you try and go to compromise enclave? And more importantly, how do we pro like prevent that from happening? Of course, on the other end of the spectrum, there's also another major threat which is we have web APIs, we have folks that potentially are making API calls constantly to APIs. So that's something we also have to defend against. In that case, we'll have you know, a similar pattern of isolation to what you had just mentioned. We have web front ends that are posting stuff that people are sending to us over the internet. These don't have long-term credentials. So we have, again, these levels of isolation to make sure that anything sensitive is as remote as possible um, and as separate as possible from anything that is entrusted. So Enclave is really well architected for security, um, but I'm also aware that the Enclave team had to put in uh, quite a lot of effort uh, to mitigate Meltdown and Spectre. Can you talk about you know, why that is, why you still had to put this work in, even though Enclave is so well architected? Yeah, sure thing. So I mean, what we've talked talked about so far is the architecture of Enclave and how that uh, limits the extent to which an attacker who's able to exploit uh, something like Meltdown, uh, limit the, the, the privilege they can gain or the capabilities that they can, uh, they can access as a result of that. But ultimately, in the case of Meltdown or any other vulnerability, we want to prevent that sort of escalation uh, entirely. Um, and you know, with Meltdown, that means taking a set of steps specific to Meltdown. Uh, you know, this involved kernel patching. Other vulnerabilities have different steps. Um, the steps for Meltdown were pretty extensive and, uh, and, and time consuming. So, you know, we started our process uh, on January 3rd before any public announcement was made. That's when we had been following along uh, with the, the InfoSec news uh, community. Uh, there, was, there were rumors that there was going to be a, a major vulnerability announced, but we and, and really nobody else um, who was not, you know, within the embargo, uh, nobody knew exactly the nature of the vulnerability. So we posted a status update saying that uh, we were planning to follow closely uh, with any news and that customers might expect uh, some maintenance to be done that might involve restarting their apps and databases. Um, so the following day, uh, the uh, announcement was actually made. Um, and so we began our patching process starting with the most 
uh, high risk set of instances that we run, which are our shared tenancy instances. Um, you know, we've already said that we treat, you know, though we love our customers, we treat all customer applications as potentially untrusted uh, by nature, but uh, shared tenancy stacks are especially untrusted because these can represent basically anybody who comes in off the internet and signs up to use Enclave. Um, so we patched all app, Bastion, in other words, SSH, uh, build and database instances and shared tenancy stacks first. Then we moved on to dedicated tenancy stacks. So patching app instances, build instances, SSH instances there. And then as a final step, uh, we scheduled maintenance windows for with customers uh, in order to uh, restart all of their databases and, and make sure that all instances in the fleet um, had been uh, patched against uh, Meltdown. Um, and we finished this process on, on January 9th, uh, about five days after we began. And you patched your own uh, Linux kernel, yes? Yeah, we had to do that. I think one thing that, had, one thing that uh, happened with this is that Meltdown turned out to be, um, like the embargo was supposed to last for about another week. And the, um, <clears throat> there were all these rumors that Frank mentioned. So as a result, the embargo kind of broke down a little early. It was supposed to happen a week afterwards. And the, uh, the main consequence of this was that um, there were many, like there weren't patches available. We use, uh, we use Ubuntu as a distribution like many people do. Um, other distributions had the same problem like Debian, for example. The, what happened was that since the embargo broke down early, they didn't actually have any updates available. So in the case of Meltdown, it's important to realize that um, even though Frank, as Frank mentioned, you know, like, it's a vulnerability in the CPU, but it can be mitigated at the, um, at the kernel level. And as a result, that's, uh, that's why we needed to apply patches. But since Ubuntu didn't have the patches in the first place, we did have to roll out, uh, we did have to like rebuild our own essentially, which we based off of the, um, like we were used for the most part, just the official kernels from upstream. So really kind of like, I guess, Linus's tree, if you will. Um, so that's what we, had, we ended up using. So we had to kind of go through that, that process of upgrading, going through like 4.4, which we were using before to 4.14, which is the one that received the upstream patches essentially. The uh, that 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 was a probably a slightly ambitious project, but the uh, and but we well, still had a little to, risky, right? Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, there's like a, it's a pretty big upgrade. There's always risk. Um, we did everything we could to really mitigate that risk by making sure that we validated that these changes were going to work. We rebuilt these kernels and still took the time, you know, to like take a few hours to run all of our integration testing against them, which is something we normally do on a nightly basis. But this time we did it like. We just like on like out of schedule to confirm that this was going to work properly. Um, ultimately, yeah, the timing worked out pretty well. Um, I think it's important to realize that we uh, Frank mentioned like we had the patches. Everything was patched on January nine. Um, the actual POCs for Meltdown, so like code someone could use to really exploit Meltdown against you, and you just had to like really copy paste it. Like you don't need to understand anything about Meltdown. Just run the code, right? This was released like about twelve hours after we finished our patching. So being able to upgrade, validate, and then deploy everywhere. That's what allowed us to uh, to get those fixes in place without having to wait for Ubuntu. And as a result, that's what allowed us to finish in time. If we had had to wait, we would have been late. Yeah. Right. And I mean, ultimately, like we were balancing trade-offs here, right? So we were trying to, uh, there, there are a variety of things we could optimize for between security of the platform, speed of getting uh, a secure mitigation out, uh, stability of the Enclave platform and avoiding any kind of introducing instability as a result of this upgrade. Um, and then, you know, optimizing for like the time uh, it took. Um, and ultimately like this, this became priority number one for Aptable as an organization. Um, and so, you know, we, we chose to optimize for all of those things except kind of like time taken, uh, which did mean, uh, you know, investing the time to patch our own Linux kernel, as Thomas mentioned, to, uh, you know, to, to not wait for uh, the Ubuntu upstream patch or the um, Ubuntu patches um, and to also thoroughly test these uh, against our full suite of integration tests and still do so on a, on a pace that uh, got everything resolved before the first POCs were introduced. So, you know, we're very proud with the outcome and we, we do think it reflects kind of our priorities as a company. Yeah, we were patched in advance of the POCs. Uh, can you talk just a little bit more about, you know, that prioritization? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it's uh, this is this is really like it. It goes to everything that we do as a company, um, and uh, you know, it. I think that there's actually a lot to learn here, uh, not only in the context of meltdown, but there are you know takeaways that we learned from meltdown and the approach that uh, we took that can be applied to by any of our customers to any sort of security risk out there. 
Um, and I think these kind of break down uh, in a few ways. So, uh, you know, first is, as we demonstrated in the threat model diagram that we presented earlier, uh, you always want to be, you want to start your security process by identifying abstract threats. So like identifying where you're vulnerable uh, and how you can architect to protect against those vulnerabilities. Um, your threats as, as a company um, may be very different from our threats that we face uh, at Aptable, but you still want to enumerate those. You want to figure out what services you depend on that are the biggest threats, and you want to figure out how you can um, you know, build your architecture or modify your architecture in order to uh, you know, isolate and protect against those threats. Um, not all threats are ab abstract, obviously. So you want to, whenever a new big vulnerability like Meltdown comes out, uh, you want to respond to it, see how it fits into your entire security model, and uh, you know, evaluate where assumptions that you may have made in the past, where those need to be amended, um, and changes you should make as a result. Um, and you know, just to hammer it all home, uh, this is a process that's uh, that should be ongoing over time. So, like the diagram that we showed was not how Enclave looked back in you know 2013, right? So this is the the accumulation of four and a half years of experience and going through this process of reviewing abstract and real threats uh, and constantly modifying our security controls over time to address those. And that's really something that pretty much every, every company who's operating in the cloud should be doing something similar to that. Right. Security is an iterative process. Yeah. It's not, <laughs> no one's perfect from day one. No one's ever perfect, but uh, it's something where we can all improve. Yeah, so uh, to summarize, um, Enclave was already really well architected uh, to protect against vulnerabilities like Meltdown and Spectre, but uh, when those vulnerabilities hit, the team still had to be very uh, thoughtful and proactive in uh, applying patches and in some cases in um, uh, being creative, uh, as with the Linux kernel. Uh, is that yeah, about right? It, yeah, it, absolutely. I think really, what it really boils down to is that um, architecting for and mitigating these vulnerabilities, that's why it buys you the time to deploy fix. Like you can't have an approach where your security is about patching st things as fast as possible. Like you have to do this to be secure. When something comes out, you have to patch it if you're vulnerable, but that cannot be your only approach. Like you need to right. afford you the time to make sure that should this, should something come out, should something big happen, you have to be in a position where you've architected yourself to have the time to do something about it. And that's indeed kind of what we've been uh, Right, yeah, the secure there. architecture gives you a little bit of room because you're not uh, as vulnerable as you would otherwise be. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so I think we have some questions from the audience. Yeah. Yeah, um, the, let, me, let me check some of these. I think the, uh, one of the first questions we had is like uh, about what Frank mentioned. You mentioned that EC2 instances are isolated in cases where PHI is handled. And uh, Sergio was asking, is this a feature that we as customers need to enable or has that been done already for them? Yeah, so I, I mean, this is, this is, uh, this is uh, just inherent to Enclave. So uh, if you look at any of your, uh, your environments and stacks on the Aptable dashboard, you'll see that there, it's clearly indicated whether they're shared tenancy or dedicated tenancy. So um, you know, your, your role or obligation here is to ensure that any sensitive workloads that you um, that you're operating. So if it's PHI or other sensitive regulated data, uh, you just need to make sure that those are running in dedicated stacks. Um, and it'll say dedicated and el eligible for PHI. So if you have any further questions about that too, um, just reach out to us. So another question we had uh, was from Norman, which is asking about uh, how has Amazon dealt with the vulnerability at the CPU level, possibly with firmware updates, or what's the plan? And that's one I think I can take. Uh, the so what they've done, and we have said, uh, essentially what Frank was mentioning much earlier in that conversation, which is you have, uh, I get Meltdown really lets you like cross isolation boundaries. Going from the container to the host, that's one of them. From AWS's perspective, that's why they don't really care about. The one they care about is going from the guest, so from the VN that you have on EC2, to the hypervisor that's living under it. Um, AWS did release, they have the ability to live patch this. It was fairly non-disruptive, I think, in most cases. Like, we had a handful of instances that were running on older hardware at AWS that had to be restarted. But for the most part, they, they, they deploy mitigation for meltdown that way. I think Spectre is the one that's, um, Spectre is more like still evolving, I think, at that stage. As we, we mentioned, it's, it's less obvious to exploit, but it's one that's going to require mo more complex mitigations than Meltdown did. Um, that is one where there are indeed uh, some updates that are available at the CPU level 
to try to mitigate the problem. But these updates, there aren't as much about um, fixing the problem in the CPU. That's something that's it hasn't happened. If it was going to happen, it would have happened by now. Um, it might happen in a few years once Intel and everyone else has you know time to like rethink how this works. But for now, what, that's what's Linus curses it enough people about it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for example. Um, so for now, like what these uh, microcode updates enable uh, allow is that they they give more options that the kernel can use to kind of tell the CPU, hey, you know, try to be a little careful here. Um, try to like do things a little slower. Um, these updates, uh, they so yeah, some of them are already available, I believe, on EC2 hosts, but the there's still a lot of discussion as to whether that's actually the right way to go about it. Um, it sounded like a couple of weeks ago, it was going to be, yeah, you have to use this new microcode updates. And then as a few days ago, the entire conversation has changed and now it's sounding like that's really not what you want to be doing. So it's still a little evolving. Um, I'm guessing there will be some impact from microcode updates. I think some of them will be leveraged, but it's unlikely that this, it won't be a, like, unfortunately, and it'd be great if it could be, but unfortunately it won't be just that the, uh, it won't be fixed with just the microcode update of the CPUs. We have time for, uh, how about one more question? Sure. Uh, we have, uh, I think we can probably, uh, like, we'll answer the rest uh, by text, like, throughout the rest of this of this webinar. I think another one we had uh, was, uh, if all sensitive data lives on our production databases, why were these patched last? Friend, you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, uh, the, the, the big consideration here is the uh, threat risk of what's running on that instance, so as we've discussed. Um, in the case of database instances, those are not running untrusted customer code. They're running database services that we, de we determine the code for, uh, and we provision those, uh, those containers, uh, and the customer doesn't have control over what's running there. Um, that said, you know, it's not entirely impossible to say, uh, you know, run something that has an effect on what's running on the host from, say, you know, a, a Postgres query or, uh, you know, MySQL query, um, or really any database query. Uh, and so there is a risk there, but it is less of a risk than, say, uh, you know, running direct uh, untrusted code from an Aptable SSH session or from an app container. Um, this is also part of the reason why we separate uh, app containers on completely separate instances from database containers, um, because those two have kind of uh, differing relative uh, classes of risk or threat. Yeah, I think ultimately it's about like, you can copy the POC to an app, you can copy a POC to a nested session. You can't copy a POC to a Postgres database, but still you could potentially exploit it. I think another thing also worth mentioning is that one of the reasons we uh, we gave our customers a little more time with databases as well, is that this will create, uh, like when we're restarting apps, Enclave is architected to, for that to be zero downtime. Many customers never realize we restarted their apps, right? Mm -hmm. When we have to restart databases, there's inevitably a little bit of downtime. So we also wanted to, you know, balance a little bit and say, you know, they're less critical. So let's give the customer like a few hours, maybe a day to know, hey, this is coming. We're going to be restarting this. Um, so just so that they have, you know, heads up about it. They can plan about it, potentially, you know, communicate with some key customers about the coming downtime too. Yeah, I've learned a lot from this conversation. Hopefully uh, some of our customers have too. We're certainly available to keep taking questions through the various support channels. Um, but Thomas, uh, you're going to present next on metric drains, yes? Yeah, that, that is correct. We're gonna be, uh, yeah, we're gonna be moving on to uh, a more um, traditional, I think, format for this webinar, uh, where we have indeed some features that we want to review. And metric drains is the first one we want to talk about. Um, so metric drains, they're about monitoring the performance of your containers, um, which, I mean, you probably know that from the name, I'm guessing. And in any case, uh, the way they work is they, they're functionally similar to log drains, except they work for database, for, me, for metrics. So the way they work is we capture metrics on your containers on a, uh, about every 30 seconds, so twice a minute, and then we just like centralize them and route them to the destination of your choice. Um, and we do that every 15 seconds, which kind of gives you like a maximum latency between the metric that you're seeing and seeing it in wherever you're sending it, that gives you 45 seconds, which is like fairly good and very close to real time if you have to look at it. Um, so the way, it, what this supports for destinations, right now we have three, uh, two of them being in FluxDB. It can be self-hosted on Enclave. So if you think about it, that's somewhat similar to how you might be running uh, you know, Elasticsearch in Kibana today. You can do the same thing with InfluxDB. Another tool is called Grafana, which is, we'll talk about Grafana in a bit, but it's a visualization tool. 
Um, you can also use InfluxDB that's hosted somewhere else. Like if you're using um, InfluxDB themselves, InfluxData, the company behind InfluxDB also has a hosted offering, for example. So you could use that too. And finally, we also support Datadog. A lot of our customers uh, use Datadog for APM and the performance in general. So that's why we, we let you enrich this by adding also metrics from your metric drains. Um, so speaking of these metric drains, it's uh, it's worth noting, you know, what, what's captured in them. Um, so there's uh, there's several things. We have the uh, first of all, each of your containers we're going to be capturing. You know, is this container running? Uh, what's the CPU usage like? Um, is there like what's the memory usage like? The memory usage is broken down by you know RSS and total memory, kind of like in the dashboard. We also give you the memory limits if you have memory management enabled. Um, we, you also get access to disk metrics, so things like disk I/O, disk usage, disk limit. The latter two only for databases, since they are not relevant for apps that don't actually have dedicated storage. Um, and so, in, in any case, these are for both InfluxDB and Datadog. The format of metrics is slightly different, so you'd want to be reviewing the documentation for these. This and this also explains, you know, like what these mean and like some suggested use cases as well. So how you might want to go about actually, you know, reviewing these metrics and doing something with them. So speaking of what you can do with them, like really what it boils down to is metric drains is that it's really about, these metrics exist. We, we used to be collecting them from the dashboard for about 18 months, I think we shipped this feature. Um, the goal of metric drains is to make it possible and easier for you really to do more with these metrics. Um, so one first use case, which is something we, we, we had a lot of requests about and which we'll be really happy to finally support, um, that's for like retention. With metric drains, you can retain metrics for as long as you want. You can retain them like for years if you want, never actually evict them. Whereas in the dashboard, for example, we give you 24 hours. Um, in the, you can also get choose to um, you know, view metrics across releases of your app. You restart your app, you resize your database. For example, you, you see your database is having you know, a hard time or like, performance, you, you, seeing that fumble, you're looking at Postgres, realize you need more caches in your database. Um, with metric drains, you can like actually resell the database and actually then compare, you know, how did that change when I made that change? Did the uh, like disk IO go down due to the fact that we can now leverage more caches? So it's really about, you know, helping you compare and really like so that you, you can just make your own decisions as to what you want to do with your metrics. Another use case for these actually is uh, once you had the data, uh, you're probably going to find some patterns, potentially realize, I mean, some patterns are obvious. If you're like approaching the memory limit, bad things may happen. Um, if you're a database and you're running out of disk, bad things will probably happen. Uh, but there's, so there's these obvious cases where you might want to alert from things. Some of them, as you know, like we already do, like if you run out of disk, we'll actually give you a heads up before you do. Um, but in any case, you might want to be able to, you know, take ownership of this as well. And so with metric drains, since you get the metrics, you get to make that decision. You get to decide, you know, right, I'm gonna be alerting on disk usage or maybe CPU. And finally, the last use case for these is really about, you know, correlation. Um, since with metric drains, you gain ownership of your own metrics, um, this allows you to incorporate them somewhere else. Um, incorporate them in dashboards that you may already have, potentially if you're using tools for APM, so something like, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Datadog, um, if you're using these uh, for your app performance, like monitoring the number of transactions per second or monitoring the um, number of users logging in or like active users, you can like set up dashboards where you potentially have, um, you know, correlations between like how many events are happening in your app and the CPU usage that helps you, you know, better understand your applications and get to the bottom of problems faster, or potentially drive new learnings and, you know, find out about new alerts you might want to create. So again, like you get a lot more, like you can enrich these metrics however you'd like really. So before I wrap up on metric drains, there's a few tips that I wanted to mention. Um, the first one is, you know, we, we now support InfluxDB as a database on Enclave. So, you know, we used to have you know, Postgres, Redis, and MySQL, and Elasticsearch, and a number of others. Uh, so InfluxDB has joined that list now. Um, so InfluxDB, I think personally, uh, it's something we use for like a number of like, we use ourselves. It's a database that we use for our own metrics product, in fact. So we, uh, we think it's a great choice of metric drains. And if you want to do this, then you probably want to also look at another tool that's called Grafana. Um, Grafana essentially provides you with uh, visualization and alerting for your metrics. So essentially, it lets you have these dashboards I showed earlier in this presentation come from, from Grafana. It's really easy to you know, create dashboards that are usable, set up alerts for events that you want to know about. Um, and it's also very easy to deploy an enclave, which, which is good too in this case. Um, and so we have this, like we have several tutorials about deploying Grafana, setting it up with the metric drain, potentially looking at some uh, 
and potentially looking at you know like some some suggested queries you may want to use. So that's about it for the for metric drains. Um, of course, if you have any questions about metric drains, we'll be taking all questions at the end of the uh, the feature review, frankly. So feel free to just like post them now, and we'll, we'll get to them. Um, as far as like other things that are new on Enclave, we have um, well a small list really. Uh, we have managed IDS, which is finally uh, generally available. So managed IDS, we talked about it on the last webinar. We were introducing it as a beta, and it's now available for everyone. Uh, we also have VPC peers and VPN tunnels, and I'll talk more about what these do and why you can use them. The CLI is a lot more usable than it used to. It provides like a lot more like functionality you can use. Our databases in general require you to do less and to you know get more out of them. And as I mentioned earlier, and, and I'm not going to go over it again, but as I mentioned earlier, we do have InfluxDB as a database now. So let's talk about HIDS. Um, HIDS, for those that don't know the acronym, it's Host Intrusion Detection System. Um, manage HIDS, as the name implies, is that we, you know, we manage it for you. Um, so the way this works is that you get, on a weekly basis, you get like audit-ready PDF and CFD reports. The goal is really that if you have a compliance requirement for intrusion detection, um, Manage HIDS is going to be a good option for you to just get that on a weekly basis without having to do any further work. Um, and the good thing about this is that, um, well, HIDS in general is actually, you know, pretty much either a requirement or something that is, the, inevitably for all frameworks, all compliance frameworks, you will get credit if you are operating HIDS on your infrastructure. So that's why we really strive to make it easy for you to do. Um, just enable it. In fact, by default, for all shared tenancy stacks, you have managed HIDS. You can access the reports. We provide them for free. Uh, for dedicated stacks, not the case. So the pricing's on the slide. Um, but for, for like all stacks, you, you can get access to them. One thing I want to mention, though, is that regardless of whether you're like purchasing the reports or not, we do operate HIDS across all our infrastructure regardless. So that about wraps it up for HIDS. Um, the next features that we have worked on are VPC peers and VPN tunnels. Uh, both of them are now in the dashboard. So it's probably worth talking about what these are, actually. So fundamentally, both of these features are about connecting your editable stack, so your apps, databases, SSH sessions, endpoints, all of this, connecting them to other networks. So in the case of VPC peering, um, this lets you, if you have your own VPC on AWS, which you, know, you may have if you have, uh, like if you're using either some managed services from, from, from AWS, like RDS, for example, or perhaps you, you're using, uh, other examples could be like AWS Lambda, or like if you're using uh, DynamoDB and so on. Well, DynamoDB doesn't have to run a VPC, but if you're using other products that have to run a VPC, or even if you have your own EC2 instances on the side, um, with a peering connection, what you can do essentially is connect your Aptable, so your Enclave stack, to over to your own VPC. Um, the benefit to you is that they're essentially going to appear as if they were the same VPC. So you'll get traffic flowing through the peering connection. All the internal endpoints that you have on Enclave will be able to connect to your other VPC. And you won't have have to expose any of these resources publicly just, just so that these two pieces of your infrastructure can talk to each other. So it's very convenient. If you have your own VPC, if you have your own VPC, you really probably want to be doing VPC peering. So that's essentially the, the gist of it. Um, the other upside of VPC peering is that it requires no maintenance at all, and it's free. So that's very convenient. The downside, however, is that um, it only works for AWS. Peering connections are like an AWS level construct that lets you peer like virtual networks in AWS. So naturally, if you're not on AWS, then you can't use a peering connection. And that's where VPN tunnels come in. Uh, VPN tunnels, like fundamentally, do pretty much the same thing. Um, they let you make sure that you have a piece of your network and that can connect to your, uh, the rest of your network. So for example, that first piece is your, your Airtable stack, and the rest of your network, it might be you know like an on-premises network. It might be maybe you're running on Google Cloud Platform or Azure, maybe AWS, but you don't want to use a peering connection. Maybe you have a hospital partner that, that has a VPN they can set up. In any of these cases, really, you have some other network arbitrarily somewhere and you want to connect to. So VPN tunnels let you do that over the public internet. And uh, if you want to use that on Enclave, so that's fully managed. So we, uh, we take care of setting up the tunnel, maintaining it, monitoring it as well. Um, but it does require like additional resources on our end. It requires that we operate a VPN gateway and then that we have you know, all that managed service behind it. So VPN tunnels on Enclave are indeed something we charge for. It's 99 a month uh, for each connection that you have. But as I mentioned, it's a lot more flexible than, uh, than VPC peering connections. 
in, uh, in both of these cases, really, the, uh, the setup, if, if you're interested in these, uh, the setup is um, to support. The reason that, that it's to support is that there's always like some key exchange that has to happen for VPN. For VPC, there's some information that we have to exchange as well, um, and potentially some like pull-up steps that we, we, we'd like to be able to explain to you on your end. So the, uh, the setup, just, you know, just contact our support, and, uh, and we can set up these connections for you. And as soon as they're set up, you, you'll be able to see them in your dashboard. So if you know, forget a little bit about which IP is being used, what network a given stack is PM2, that's the new features that we introduced this quarter. Um, you can now see the connection details in the dashboard, whereas VPC peers and VPN tunnels have existed for a few years now in the future. All right, so that, that about to wrap it up for, for uh, tunneling and connections. Um, the next changes, set of changes that we released is about the CLI. Um, so for the CLI, we have um, the first one is that we have JSON output now. Um, so you can see the example here. If you set that aptable output format variable, um, you get output for your CLI that is going to be in JSON. Um, so right now, it's a text or JSON. Um, there's two upsides for JSON. Um, the first one is that, well, I mean, if you're like reading this for a script, um, piping it into something, posting it in the shell, JSON is, of course, like more structured. The format is stable. Um, so it's going to be more easy. Like it's going to be easier for you to use, um, to use in the scripting context. The other upside is that since this is kind of like machine, like designed to be consumed by machines, um, JSON also gives us the option of like providing you with a lot more information. So for example, if you're like doing aptable apps and listing your apps in an environment, um, normally you would just get a list of apps, but if you're using JSON output, you also get the Git remotes, you get the list of services, you get the scale of these services, so you get a lot more information as well. The second change to the CLI, this one is a more minor change, but it's really about um, some commands that have changed. So the db create command has now changed. Uh, the, the upside here is that it now supports um, picking a version. So you now have the option for wh whenever you're running uh, db create, you can choose, you know, maybe I want to use a specific version of Redis. Something you could do via the dashboard, but now it's in the CLI too. So if you have some automated processes where potentially, you know, you're re rebuilding your entire environment on a weekly basis and you want to make sure that, you know, doing this in staging, for example, and you want to make sure that you're using the same versions that you're using in production, um, that's something you can now script, whereas before you would have had to either use different versions or go through the dashboard. Speaking of this, you can also, of course, use the uh, DB versions command to get a list of versions that are available. And you can, of course, also get all of this in JSON format, too. All right. So speaking of databases and their versions, something else we did is to make our databases a little smaller overall. Um, the first change is about MongoDB. Uh, MongoDB our MongoDB instances, uh, when we restore them from backup, used to behave kind of the way MongoDB behaves when you do that, which is it tries the replica, tries to join the existing replica set. The only problem is that the replica thinks it's the original. Like the, like the, the restore backup thinks it's the original, so it joins the replica set, it doesn't find itself in it, so it's very concerned, and then it just kind of like chooses not to do anything. So you can't really use the restore instance immediately. You have to do some, um, you have to do some follow-up reconfiguration, essentially telling the new restore database, hey, you know, you're on your own now. So don't try to rejoin the existing set, you know, just be your own set. Um, that can be a little risky and it's also, it used to be manual. So what we changed here is that this is now fully automated. So if you have MongoDB, the good thing is you don't need to think about this, you don't need to care about this anymore. It's just gonna happen for you and you won't have to do anything. Second change for databases, which is probably further uh, ranging, it's gonna, it's gonna affect like more people, is that our databases now optimize their configuration according to their container size. So in most part, our configurations are now, they're not particularly either unique to Enclave or particularly aggressive. They're really kind of what the, uh, largely the default like recommended sizing for these various databases, uh, whether that's for Postgres, MySQL, and so on. Um, the upside of this is that whenever you launch a database on Enclave now, if you choose like a four gig database, then we're gonna you know, configure your database so that it behaves ideally on that four gig footprint. For example, in the case of Postgres, that's gonna mean that we're gonna try to use a little more memory for joins and everything, but still to retain about fifth, like, I think it's 60% of its memory for caches, for example. Um, if you're using MongoDB, we can do similar configurations as well to make sure that your database essentially operates as long as possible, like uh, as much as possible, operate within its memory limits and so on. So that's for you, the upside is it makes it easier to like experiment with new footprints. So if you, I say you're having performance problems and you're suspecting it's just that your database is undersized, um, you can like, you know, make it twice as big, scale it up twice, scale it up four times, 
the upside is now you don't have to, you know, second guess yourself. It's like either it's performing better, in which case it's great, uh, or it's not, in which case you may need to scale further, but at least you don't have to be wondering, oh, maybe I also need to reconfigure it myself. Maybe I also need to do some tuning afterwards. We now like kind of take care of that tuning for you so that your database really always behaves like optimally. That about wraps it up. Um, I think we'll probably have perhaps some questions. Let me. Uh, yeah, there's a couple from the audience, right? Thomas. So. All right, so we'll, we'll have a few questions. Um, I think the, uh, the first one is, like, can I create a custom metric drain that calculates its own metric based on a query of a Redis job Q lens, for example? Um, so metric drains uh, don't forward, they don't like arbitrarily, you can't like send your own data to a metric drain. However, what you can do for your use case, we actually do that for ourselves. And it's something that, that uh, we probably have very specific ideas on how you can do that. Essentially for this case, what you want to probably do is just use whatever like destination you have. So for example, if you have um, InfluxDB, you can very easily set up something that just monitors, like you just query Redis, for, like. A, like the number of keys in your queue, and then you can just push that the data point uh, all the way to InfluxDB. In other words, like you don't actually even need the metric drain for this. You just need to talk to InfluxDB directly. Um, the metric drain is more about like actually collecting these metrics and draining them somewhere. Um, which, in this case, if it's a custom metric, you don't even need that that first part. You can just grab the metric and send it to your database. All right, we have another question, which was from Sergio, who's asking, what would you recommend as the most turnkey solutions for metrics? Uh, personally, I think I would recommend trying out InfluxDB and, uh, and, uh, and Grafana. The reason for this is that, um, well, first off, we're a little more familiar with these products, so that's why we're able to provide more, like, if you look at our tutorials for Grafana, for example, we're able to provide um, more like query examples and everything. And I think, generally speaking, Grafana and InfluxDB, are, you're a little more closer to the metal, I guess, so they're a little more straightforward to get started with. If you want to just query your CPU usage, it, there's a fairly straightforward way to do it. Uh, that dog becomes very valuable when you have, um, if you're already using it for something else. If you're already pushing APM there, then you probably want to be using that dog instead uh, because you're going to have you know, some metrics over there. That being said, again, like we don't have as much experience with that dog ourselves. We use it mostly because like, the reason we, we support it is because we have a number of customers using it for APM. Um, I can't say for sure, but ultimately it's probably worth you know, reviewing both and kind of making your own opinion. Um, but we do, as I mentioned, have a little a few more tutorials um, if you're using uh, if you're using InfluxDB and Grafana. And we, I think we also had another question. This one from an anonymous attendee. Uh, can we use VPC peering for geographical redundancy? Um, so yes, actually, as of a few uh, a few months ago, I think. Um, well, as of we invent, really, uh, AWS does in fact support VPC peering across regions now. Um, the only thing you have to keep in mind about this is that if you want to do this between two stacks on enclaves, if you have one stack, like if you have, if you want to have some of your enclave resources in US West and some of your enclave resources in US East, um, you will need to have two stacks for enclaves. There'll be two isolated stacks. There is, the, the stack is actually part of your base C if you have a production enclave plan. So you do have to keep in mind that the, um, the, the, there will be like a base price for having that second stack. The VPC peering connection will be free, but the thing you are connecting to, this one you will have, uh, there will be some extra like base fee that you have to pay. Um, that said, one other thing I want to mention briefly about this is that like outside this context, we also do have, um, for like all of these, uh, for, all, like, for all, everything that is backup related, we already have some geographical redundancy. So if you have a database that's in US East, your backups are already in US West. Um, that doesn't mean that like, it's not necessarily, you may want to go farther than this, and I think you might be right. Um, but it's something to keep in mind that there's already kind of a baseline that's uh, that's been taken care of that's been taken care of by Enclave automatically. And we had another question that just came in, so good timing on this one, Norman. Uh, the so you're asking, it looks like our CLI apps command now return the number of containers per app in the JSON. Did I see that correctly? Is JSON not a default, and is it live, or is there a parameter where you choose your desired output format? Um, so that's a lot of questions, but they're all good questions. Um, the way it works is uh, indeed that we the number of containers is now part of the Attable apps output. Um, so you can see it here. You get a list of services, and for each of these services. Um, you get the number of containers for that service as well as the size. And JSON is not the output, uh, the default output format. We we take uh, 
like generally speaking, we, we try very hard never to break backwards compatibility. And we do know that we have some customers that are currently using the text output and kind of pulsing this and extracting data from it. So we did not want to change the default or anything. Uh, but to enable it, it is indeed live right now. To do that, you have to set an environment variable, which is called Aptable Output Format. You can see this at the top of the screen on the right. It's called Aptable Output Format, and you set that to JSON, and this will give you JSON output. Um, and you don't have to like take a note of this. You can also just like look for like, JSON output. We probably have a change log post about this and documentation about it as well, if you want to like find that exact string. But in any case, yes, you saw that correctly. <laughs> many, many customers have been asking about that, uh, that kind of extra information in Aptable apps, so that's why we... Uh, took the opportunity to include it in the JSON output. I believe that's about it. It looks like we are done with the questions. Um, all right, so the Chaz, I think I will end it back over to you for the, the wrap up. All right, fantastic. Thank you all so much uh, for participating and thanks to the audience and everyone who's watching along right now uh, for coming along. Uh, the next update webinar will be on April 25th uh, at the same time. You can register using the link here. And I believe I have a, hmm, my copy and paste isn't working, otherwise I would drop the link into the chat here. But you can just hit this link, register. Um, that's it, thank you very much, we appreciate it. Bye. Thank you.